And I'd love to talk about it some more, and I do want to, and maybe we can before the end of the show, but we got Ralph on, and we'll keep him on hold. All right, talk to Ralph. I'll talk to you later. Bye, guys. Have fun. Bye. Bye. All right. That's our resident psycho from Austin, Texas. (laughs) (laughs) That was a good play. We had a good time. But Yeah, um, that was the play that uh, Michelle directed or wrote or – well, I don't know if she wrote it. She, I don't know. How, what, she, adapted it? she adapted it. Oh, she adapted it? Yeah, it was different uh-huh. stories from different people. I think some of the stories might have been hers, but there were like, I don't know, eight, eight or so, nine maybe scenes that were each different stories, and they had different actresses that would tell the story, and, you know, she put it together. So who was just on the phone? That was Chris from Austin. We call her Pippi, and she was, <laughs> she was in, uh, you know, uh, Michelle's was in the play. time on that. Yeah, and she was in the play as well. So. Uh-huh. Yeah. They were running buddies for a month, I guess. I get together. you. Hyde Park Theater in Austin, Texas. Yeah, it was, it was pretty wild. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hi, Ralph. Sure. How are you doing? Hey. Ralph? Hey, Hello. Mel. <laughs> I'm assuming that's who you are. Yes. Welcome to the show. We didn't actually introduce you properly. Yeah, yeah I'm really insulted about that, too. <laughs> <laughs> So how's so it how, going? You're going to be in the AWOTS band. I, I assume you've started learning some of this. Uh, I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm doing my homework. Um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, I, I have a lot of practicing to do and a lot of uh, memorizing to do. But it's real. It's cool because I'm, you know, it, Todd put um, these tracks online. Um, separating out the different instruments so we could learn what we did. And um, you can hear, like before every take, you could hear people fooling around and talking and, um, you know, eating crackers and stuff. And um, it was cool because it was like being in a time machine and going back to that room with all those guys. You know, I could hear all the little, you know, patter and everything. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. it was really, I remember what, what, I remember how much fun it was. Back at Moogie's place. When we, yeah, when we did it, and uh, and I can't believe you know people people let Todd get away with this. <laughs> no, I mean there's so much adventurous stuff on here that uh, I mean nowadays on a major label no one would allow. You know, they just it would be too weird. Um, so yeah, but I've been practicing. Practicing. I got, I'm, I'm in the middle of one other project that I'm trying to finish, and then I'm going to be practicing 24 hours a day. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I'm so looking forward to the gig. I mean, I, I can't wait. It's it's going to be so much fun for me to 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 play, you know, and play in front of people. So well, you haven't been a while. I know you've been doing other things, but uh, nothing quite like this, I guess. Uh, yeah, I, I I've been. Most of the stuff I do is in the studio, you know, for for a really long time, you know, like 25 years or something. And um, so I didn't really, uh, you know, I didn't really play with any human beings uh, for longer than a couple of minutes, you know, <laughs> since then. And um, so it's going to be it's going to be really fun. I'm, I'm going to love it. I yeah, wish it was. Last, I guess you'll have some you'll probably have friends and family checking it out. Yeah, in L.A. I have my family coming and uh, I think a couple of friends, so that will be nice. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, I don't think none of them – well, they, they've seen like uh, – um, they've seen like uh, – there were two or three videos of, uh, of Utopia online, you know, on YouTube. But other than that, they haven't really ever seen me play outside of the house, you know. <laughs> So, speaking of Utopia, and I don't want to get you in trouble, so make sure you know what you're doing here when you answer this question. (laughs) I'm already in trouble trying to learn this music, let me tell you. (laughs) Has Todd said anything about the uh, opener set outside of A Wizard? No, it's a secret. And, um, um, you know, as of now, um, I'm I'm not playing on the opening set. Oh. But I'm trying to get a hold of him because... I think I think he did that just because he didn't want to uh, uh, tack, you know, since I had so much to learn anyway, mm-hmm. you know, and, and we're only going to have one rehearsal. So I think maybe I'm hoping that he did that for my benefit because 
I'm, I would love to play more. You know, I know when we, when the gig is over, I'll just be getting started. You know, <laughs> but I think no, he knew you a, were coming on this show, and that's why he hasn't told you yet. That's probably it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. He doesn't like those secrets to get out. Yeah, maybe, maybe. I mean, yeah, I guess he has a different concept for it, or something. Maybe. I, I thought maybe he just didn't want the rest of the guys to have to learn a whole new thing. You know. Mm-hmm. But um. Yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and talk him into letting me do something in the opening show. I don't know if it'll succeed, but oh, good. <laughs> yeah, all right. Well, we'll, we'll maybe I'll we'll do a dance or something. Surprise! You can do what? Maybe I'll come on stage and dance or something. You know, <laughs> <laughs> just learn the uh, full icon again, and that's all everybody. Hey, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Seven Ray. Yeah, so, so you guys, you guys promoted all these concerts and. Do you, do you promote a lot of those, a lot of concerts, or is this your first, uh, <laughs> your first uh, event? Your uh, first rodeo? <laughs> not our first what? rodeo. We we we've done a few small, smaller uh-huh. things, and then we went big with this. Uh, the first Bay Wizard show we did, mm-hmm. uh, the first two in Akron, and then one in Connecticut. Right. And then somebody else took over Chicago and Minnesota and Bethesda, Maryland, and we don't, of course, have anything to do with the ones overseas. Right, and we just we we made the mistake of going to Minnesota at the last minute and seeing what a great show it was, and decided we couldn't let it end, and ah. we got crazy and decided to book some more, and knew that we needed to do more than one or two, so we just went crazy and did four. Yeah, <laughs> so so you, are you enjoying it? Are you are, is it are you enjoying that aspect of uh, of the music business? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know if enjoy would be the word. It's fun, sure. I like actually going to the shows better. But yeah. um yeah, it's fun. There's a lot of stuff we learned and now it seems like the the ones for California were just so ahead of the curve because we kinda know a lot of what we're supposed to be doing and what the rider looks like and what Todd expects and the band and the sound yeah. and all that kind of stuff. We've had to learn a lot, but there's still things that you know, advertising in cities we don't know anything about is tough. Yeah. Um, venues is tough. Yeah, yeah. But, you know. Are you uh, gonna be at all the shows? Of course. Yeah. yeah. Oh good. Yeah, I know most. You know, we we hear that a lot of promoters don't even go to the shows, but we are fan slash promoters, so we will be there. So you got uh, there's like a whole. I'm I'm noticing on Facebook there's a whole. Uh, I mean, at least that I'm aware of. There's kind of a core of people that um, I see. Um, you know, they're pretty involved in uh, in Todd's. You know. Whatever he's doing, you know they're they're really into it, and there's photographs and uh, <laughs> and um, crazies. <laughs> what'd you say? We are the crazies. Yeah. So so but so now, have you all been doing this for a long time? No, and I I think the term that Todd wants to use for that group is cultish, and I don't, not in a negative way, but the people that are into it are into it big time. And there's, yeah. there's a, it's not a, you know, hundreds of thousands of people, but yeah. it's a very vocal group and a very active group. And you will see a lot of the same people at all four shows. Yeah. And of course, not the complete crowd or whatever, but you'll see a good several dozen of the same people. Uh-huh. And they will be having a blast. But um, we, we've been doing the radio show for a couple of years. Yeah. And some of these fans go back as far as, um, you know, the 60s and NAS. And wow! Brand new. <laughs> yeah. So and and so, do you all like? Uh, do they all hang out? I mean, I guess they all live all over the country, right? Yeah, there's a lot of travelers, and we have um, we had people. Let's see, what was it, Mel? For Akron, we had I think it was five or six different countries represented for that show, the wow. very first one. Yeah. Yeah. So it's. Um, oh, and we already know that that there's uh, someone coming from Japan to California. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, we got somebody and, coming in from Japan, but there there are people all over the country, sure, and they'll be coming in from East Coast, West Coast, Midwest, um, all over the place. So yeah, Chicago, we got a lot of Chicago contingent this time around. We just got somebody who found out from Georgia coming in. Two people uh, from Georgia we know of. Uh, um, so yeah, Good is that is that kind of like is that what uh, Todd Stock was was? Yes, a lot of Todd Stock people will be there. Todd Stock had people from all all over the the world as well. They had people from Japan and um uh, Scotland and New Zealand. It was it was pretty wild. And, and then, what what was it exactly? Cuz I don't know the details about it. 
I mean, I, I know I, about Todd Stein. Okay. Well, I mean, I know just that, that he invited a bunch of people to camp out at his place or something. Yes, it was exactly. to celebrate his 60th birthday. Oh. Yeah. And so, I, like, so how many people showed up? So I think it was around 400, 300, 400, something like that, several wow. hundred. And they camped out on this property. It's a big piece of property in, in Hawaii. And they did a, a concert. The final night was the first ever uh, arena show, the new album he has. Ah. The first time he'd ever played it. So the band was there. and Yeah, it was pretty wild. Probably would have been a lot more people if it wasn't in Hawaii. It was very expensive at that time of the year to yeah. get out there. And, this uh, was what in, a lot of people, and it was a great group, and you know there were no problems. It was nice. This was last year, or uh, June, not the last the summer, the summer before last summer. Oh yeah, two thousand and seven. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and everybody went for like a whole week, and some people went for longer. And wow, that must have helped. been amazing. Yeah, the people all helped build a couple of tiki bars there on the property, uh -huh. and um, well, what else they have? Oh, they had a little swimming pool that that somebody built or whatever <laughs> I mean, it was amazing it was it was quite a community yeah i bet it wasn't uh i i i'm i can see like just from what i've seen on facebook and i i only go on there i mean i hardly ever go on there i have been recently because of this but um um people have there's a lot of interesting people who have interesting professions and and they're people from all over, and they seem they keep writing to me, which is really nice. You know, I, I had no idea that anybody really knew who I was. You know, <laughs> are you kidding? Yeah. I don't know. Utopia Aww. fans are hardcore as well. Nikki Nichols yeah. was there for Todd Stott. I don't know if you really. Know. Yeah, Nikki was there. Wow. Was yeah, there. he's a yeah. great guy. I love him. Uh, Frog Labot's ex-wife was there. Um, oh, I got that. Uh, the Asian lady? Yes, uh huh, Elon. And uh, Bobby nice. Strickland, who is going to be in the band with you. And yeah, yeah. He was there. Yeah, it was yeah. good stuff, man. It's, 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 uh, it's really very hard to describe, but it was a very special time, that's for sure. And the people that went, you know, they'll never forget it. I can promise you that. It must have been amazing. I, 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 I can't, I, you know, every, I've been immersing myself in all of Todd's music lately, and and I just, this guy should be like the biggest star in the world, you know. He's he's just so his stuff is so classic and so um uh unpredictable and so well done and every aspect of it is so excellent, you know, and and it's so the the lyrics are great and he's really soulful and sincere and the melodies are great and you know, it's uh um, you know, I keep thinking, God, I wish I, I had a, a my own TV sh network TV show or something. I'd, I'd have him go on there, you know. <laughs> but um, I mean, I know he's got he's got a lot of fans, but a lot of people, um, especially younger people, don't uh, don't even haven't even heard his name. And uh, a lot of my friends who are, you know, in their twenties or early thirties. Um, you know, they don't know who he is and, and a lot of them are musicians and I know they, they would just they would just love his music. I, I made a I made a C D for a couple of friends of mine, uh, of my favorite stuff you know. It wasn't even my favorite stuff, I just I just picked I picked out a bunch of songs, you know, and, and put them on C D for people and they're loving it, you know, and they 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 wish you know they they keep saying where's this guy been man this guy is really amazing yeah it's 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 a story we talk about a lot here we can't figure yeah. it out and a lot of the masses haven't caught on with it and there's all kind of different theories but I don't think anybody listening will disagree with you on that at all and you know part of the deal I don't know maybe you know, he's, he's not interested in that also yeah I don't know I mean I, it's the Hall of Fame of course hasn't done much uh yeah. you know to help that situation considering all the, the things he's done on his resume you would think he would at least get a nomination at one point and uh, he was there actually for uh to sign autographs they they did put a display of him up there while we were in Akron Ohio for those gigs and they said he had the biggest crowd that they've ever seen 
Um, at, where was this? At the, this was uh, at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, yeah. To get huh. his autograph. There were several hundred people there. Huh. But, you know, it's like... It's, and it's, they still haven't even nominated him. No, no. Who's in charge of that, anyway? <laughs> A small uh, group of people. Han, uh, what's his last name, Mel? I want to say oh, Wiener, but that's kind of... <laughs> Wiener, W-E-N-N-E-R. When, um, oh, oh, Jan Wenner? Yeah, uh-huh. Oh, the, uh, the publisher of Rolling Stone. Yep, yep. I don't know if he still is a publisher of that, but so he, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, is his thing. Yes, mm-hmm. I, I see. Yeah, so they've had some weird. I don't understand. I don't. They, I wish they would just call it like the the Popular Music Hall of Fame. Yeah, so a lot of the people in it aren't rock and rollers necessarily. Yeah, they would start a separate one for that, or you know, have a Pop Hall of Fame, a Rock Hall of Fame, a Country Hall of Fame, because you know they had. It's you know, Madonna's not rock and roll, for example. I wouldn't say right. Donna Summer's sure. not rock and roll. Um, yeah, but there's lots of bands. You know, the cars aren't in it. Uh, uh-huh. Kind of shocked by some of the deals, the people, you know, that don't get nominated. There was actually two years ago, they nominated this band called uh, Chic, who had Sheik. one hit song Sheik. called La Freak. Oh, Chic, yeah, yeah, I Chic, guys. Chic. Yeah, I call it. Is it Chic? What is it? Chris Chic. 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 Is it Chic? Yeah, yeah, Chic. Or Chic. Yeah, I'm terrible with these kind of things. But um, yeah, La Freak. That song. Yeah, I know that song. I, I I know all the people in that band and and the singers. And uh, in fact, when I met my wa- the day I met my wife, she was she was uh, she's a singer. Well, she doesn't do it anymore, but she's directing plays now. But she uh, um, she was a singer songwriter, and she had three albums out on different on RCA and uh, Capitol. But w- when I met her. She was in a rehearsal, and she was singing with. Um, there was a couple of other background singers with her, and they were the girls from Chic. They were the two singers from Chic. Where my wife was singing with them in somebody's band. I can't remember who, but it's funny. I met them at the same time. Yeah. Well, but uh, out of yeah, hell. they're not rock and roll at all. No. No. You know, it's kind of like high school, you know, I think. There's like an, there's an in crowd, you know. I don't know who they are or what makes them, you know, any better than anybody else. But there are just certain, I guess, cliques of people that um, make, you know, that, that um, know each other. And occasionally they let somebody else in, you know, and their standards, I'm not sure what their standards are for membership, you know, but mm-hmm. that's what it seems like to me, you know. There's, there's there's a bunch of people who are, you know, who are sort of, uh, you know, that's in, in the know. Well, also, it's, it's the, on the flip side of that, too, there are people that burn bridges and, and get True. excluded from things like that. And I don't know what Todd's relationship is with this guy or with Rolling Stone. He's never really got a lot of appreciation in that magazine and never yeah. was on the cover, to my knowledge. So yeah. you know, there could be something there, too, where he's just getting blackballed versus... Yeah, um, I'm sure uh, there... I, I, I'm not sure, but it, there's a good chance that I'm sure... I, I'm sure he's burned quite a few bridges, you know. <laughs> just, uh, you know, I don't say that as a criticism, but, uh-huh. you know... Um, you know, when when you're young, you do a lot of stupid things. Or maybe they were, maybe it wasn't stupid. You know, maybe it was just being honest. Yeah, um, who knows? But, um, All right, well, I've been rude. I've had a call on hold for a while, so if you don't mind, I'm going to take this call right quick. Sure. And uh, we'll see what we got from area code 773. Should I hang? Should I stay on? No, that's for you, yeah. They're going to talk to you, I think. Oh, okay. 773, you with us? Yes. Uh, hey. Chris Williams from, well, normally from Kansas City, but I'm from Chicago at the moment. Hey, man. <laughs> yeah. You can't be from two places, man. you got to well, choose. Well, yeah, actually, I split my time between both. Oh. But, uh, anyway, a um, couple things. One, uh, the uh, from what I understand on the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Jan Winner has essentially a veto. So they supply a list, right? This big panel supplies a list, and then Winner can basically strike anybody that he likes. So, really? anyway, that, yeah. So I read that basically there was an expose about that huh. in another magazine. I think it was Spy a number of years ago, and they had said you know, that uh, that's what went on from somebody who participated on the panel. Hmm. So who knows? Todd may have been on the first cut at one point and uh-huh. got, got chopped because of some personal 
peak. <laughs> yeah, I've, well, I've heard of that happening with Jan Winter a few other times, yeah. too, actually, So, yeah. in other situations. So yeah. it's a good chance it's, that's what it is. I appreciate his magazine, no doubt. And the yeah, one, yeah. But, uh, you know, I just uh, he, he <laughs> I think, you know, it should, uh, it should be an independent body, and he shouldn't have that ability to uh, strike it. But uh, yeah. Anyway. Well, um, time will tell. It's it's you know it's like when you listen to music from 50 years ago or 100 years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, you know the stuff that's the classics. You know are the things that are high quality and memorable and universal and timeless and um, you know they're un- they they're they stand the test of time and people you know. With every gener, every, there's people in every generation that appreciate them and buy the buy the music and listen to it. And um, I, to me, that's sort of like the test of something. There's plenty of um, artists that had big, huge records in the 30s or the 20s or the 40s or 50s, you know, that um, nobody remembers. You know, there's plenty of one-hit wonders and. There's a lot of novelty records that were big and dance records and stuff, but the stuff that people remember is the stuff that I guess it has a timeless quality to it. Mm-hmm. And that's what Todd's stuff, Todd's music it has, you know. Well, if you read the British music press mm-hmm. currently, uh, Todd gets name-checked by a lot of uh, electronica. What does a that mean, of- name-checked? Oh. I mean, uh, that he is cited as an influence. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. On a, a lot of the young kids who are doing, you know, uh, you know synthesi- synthesizer stuff, especially yeah. if they're using, you know, classic synthesizers. Right. Which is something that's completely lost on me because uh, I've dealt with some of those old machines. They were cantankerous and, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. you know, and yeah. you know, given that you can get the exact same sound in a plug-in. Uh, right. <laughs> But but, uh, it, but but that's not as cool, man. <laughs> yeah, you get. I mean, it's like you'll see somebody, and they've got a uh, you know a, a Moog model. Was it the fifty five, the really big one? Mm-hmm. And you know, just patch chords, and they're scrambling like My- Michael Cotton of the Tubes to re- repatching stuff. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I guess it just you know. Well, the real hardcore. I'm sorry to, to interrupt. Mm, yeah, no, please. The real hardcore. Uh, the real hardcore uh, vintage guys insist there's there's a, a real difference in sound, and I'm sure there is, but it's not um, appreciable to most people, you know. Where where do you stand on that? I mean, do you bother to maintain your old instruments, or do you? You know, if I I wish I did. I I sold a bunch of them about maybe I don't know seven years ago or something, because I and I sold I had a whole bunch of them and. Uh, I sold them all because I didn't have any place to put them, and uh, and I wish I would have kept them. But I, you know, I would have had to get storage or something for them. I mean, they wouldn't fit in my studio. There were so many of them, and and uh, there's a lot of work just maintaining them. You know. Yeah, you know, they're finicky. They're really finicky, and of course, some people have retrofitted them, and and those are supposed to be much more reliable. Um, but you know, it's funny the day after the day after I sold them all to this guy and the day after I woke up in the morning and I, I called him and said I changed my mind you know and he said sorry <laughs> uh, I said I figured you'd say that you know but he 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 was a tinkerer though he liked to open them up and mess around with them and stuff it was kind of a hobby for him so any any real jewels that you sold um well I really liked uh are you a keyboard player um, I don't play, but I, I mean, I saw Roger Powell demoing for ARP back in the day. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. fascinated by synthesizers, you know, yeah. since I first ran across them. Yeah, well, I, yeah, I had, um, I had a mini Moog and a, a, um, a memory Moog and a Prophet 10. I had, I was one of the few people out of oh. Prophet 10, which for th- all those who don't know what that is, it has two keyboards and it's. Um, so you can play two different sounds at once, polyphonically, and uh, it's it was a it w- was very heavy to carry around, and it was always me- always uh, 
going out of order, but it did sound great. And then um, I had a, uh, a Juno, uh, Roland Juno, I forget what. 80? I guess, yeah, 80. Is that, that's, I don't know, there's one of them that was one of the early ones and sounds really fat, and it's very simple to use. It's, it's really, um, it, it, it's, um, you know, it doesn't have too many variables, doesn't have too many choices, and um, I, I really loved that. I kind of missed that one. I used to on a lot of records, um, but uh, yeah. So, you know, I have friends who are, um, you know, professional musicians who have warehouses full of that stuff. You know, I, I know one guy's got about uh, five or six Hammond B3s, you know, <laughs> and other other big organs like that. You know, um, you know, right. has a, he, he has he's in a band in the rehearsal studio. Uh, is a big warehouse and um, they own it so he just every time he sees somebody selling something cool he he buys it and just puts it away you know for posterity I guess mm. he uses he uses them on records and stuff though well I don't know if you knew this uh, Todd's last album Arena uh, he produced it entirely on a laptop uh, I didn't know that, but I believe it. Yeah, sounds a great laptop, too. A laptop, a uh, a USB based uh, microphone, uh-huh. and that was it. One mic and a laptop. Wow. And everything else was uh, was virtual instruments or virtual uh-huh. processing. So, yeah. You know, I mean, a lot of people. Know, that's uh, what a lot of people <laughs> are doing that now. Mm-hmm. So what what will you be taking on the road for these AWOPS gigs? Um. I have requested, um, um, I think I'm going to have the same thing Roger had, which was a uh, a Nord, I think it's called a Nord lead, no, not Nord lead, but it's it's a Nord keyboard, which is really cool. Um, but it it doesn't have a, a weighted action. The, the keys don't feel like a piano. They feel more like, um, they're, they're really easy, they, they go down really they have no weight to them, and uh, I found out that I'm going to be playing mostly piano parts, and so I wanted to have a weighted uh, weighted keyboard, like I have at home, and um, so that's what I'm. I think they're going to get me. The the uh, the uh, production company has one, and so they're going to get me the same kind of have at home, and then I'm going to because uh, I have to. You know, I don't know if this is interesting for anybody who's listening. Uh, I- you got you got a bunch of keyboard players in the chat room that are listening. So. Oh, okay. Um, but uh, you know, that is particularly that album. Um, everything runs together, so there's no time to really change your sounds, you know. And um, uh, so I'm going to program the whole show on my keyboard and then just save it to a flash drive. By the whole show, I mean all the sounds I use. Yeah. Yeah. So every time, so when every time a song changes, I can just hit a, a foot switch or a button, and it'll be the next song, and I don't have to fool around with, you know, changing the sounds, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, I know. I remember watching uh, Greg Hawks, uh, uh-huh. the other key player in. Yeah, the, yeah. And I'm a fan. He was busy as hell the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> Always switching something or. <clears throat> some weird sound and all that so yeah i saw the new cars in concert and uh you know they blew me away i i was it was such a great show mm-hmm. and he was impeccable you know and, and he was one of the he's a real um, you know synthesizer pioneer i mean he's he he's i'm sure what did you call it a checklist or something a um i don't know the Sorry? the he was an, I'm sure he was an influence on a lot of oh, electronic oh, yeah. name check name check there you go yeah <laughs> um and he uh yeah but he 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 was he did some really inventive stuff with that band and it was all really hooky and memorable and um clever and you know the sounds were just perfect for what was going on for the you know for the band well now i, think, I believe he he for the AWOT shows was using some vintage equipment. Chris, am I right? 
Um, for the A-Watch shows? I, I think don't he was. Think so. I thought I thought it was mo- almost all modern modern uh, keyboards. I don't well, know. I remember I mean, he said he... one of the reasons he brought Greg in was because of some of the old stuff he had kept. So uh, there, oh. there were seven, I believe it was seven different keyboards that were used. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, it's 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 something else. And I'm, I think he had a couple of old school things that, that that they needed for some of the odd sounds that, you know, probably aren't typical anymore on the album. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, it may have been pre-recorded too. I, I don't know. It could know. have been, yeah. Yeah. Speaking of old school, what did you play back in your Utopia days on stage? Boy, I don't even remember. Um, I think on the cover of Another Live, you're playing an RMI keyboard computer. Um, yeah, actually, no, I didn't. I played some of that on um, on this record. Actually, I played some RMI, and Moogie played some of it too. But on stage, I played. I played uh, a Hammond organ and uh, a clavinet, Honer clavinet, and um, what else? I had a couple other things. I think I had an analog synth. I can't remember what kind it was. It might, it might have been. Uh, I can't remember. I might have even been hooked up to. Frog stuff or something or rod. I don't. I don't really remember. It was something. We oh, might have been processing it or something. Maybe I don't know. It was something Todd. You know, it, it <laughs> belonged to Todd. And uh, in fact, I didn't even learn how to use that kind of stuff until years later. Um, you know, I guess I just was lazy or something. I don't know. Um, but, um, we got, we got someone in our music. chat room says you played a Yamaha YC45 organ on another live. A keyboard is Tommy Z says that. That ring a bell? Oh, Tommy. Uh, yeah, I did play. <clears throat> I did play a Yamaha organ with. I, I, I mean, I'll. I believe him if that's what he said. <laughs> you know, he knows. You know, yeah. he's the guy. He actually, he and Roger really helped me out for this gig because. They both had charts for all these songs, you know. They both had written music for all these songs, which saved me a lot of time. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, actually, they didn't have it for all the songs, but maybe about half of the songs. Well, have you seen any video or heard any of the live stuff? Of like, this concert? Yeah. Uh-huh. No, I guess I should, shouldn't I? Yeah. No. Um, is there a video that has the whole show somewhere, or...? Are they might just... be. Uh, I will email you. We will discuss. <laughs> yeah, that would be a real good idea for me to see that. But I'm you know, been meaning to do that anyway because yeah, yeah, it would be good to kind of see how the stage is set up and what all they do. Yeah, and then, uh, of course, you know, if you have a, a video, you have a, a audio as well. And yeah, and here, but I, I tell you, I, I was, I'm not a, you know, the expert on it. Couldn't write a review, but I, I thought the sound that they got about as close as you could humanly get to uh, uh, duplicating the sound of the album. Uh, uh-huh. that's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. And there's all kind of stuff. I think it was, how many instruments did they say Bobby played, Mel? Was it like 19? No. It was, it was like He nine. plays keyboards, too. Yep. Yeah, but yeah, I think he played, played about nine. And, nine no, it's more than that. You'll see him get out. He plays, two. one time he plays three different sacks at the same, or two different at the same time. Yep. Oh yeah, he does that Roland Kirk thing. Yeah, and he's got this um, flute-looking deal for, I think it's flamingo. I mean, it's, he has all kind of different uh, instruments that he plays. We'll have to uh, ask him, I guess. But I, I think it was more than nine. It's a lot. And a kazoo. Yeah. Yeah, kazoo. I mean, it's it's, gr- it's great to have somebody like that in the band. As it's kind of like the utility player on a baseball team, you know. The, yeah, the percussionist, as we learned. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. But uh, yeah. I, I, w- I do want to study all that stuff. You know, I've been just concentrating on making sure that I have all the, the form of all the songs, and I've been concentrating on just getting my fingers, you know, my hands working. <laughs> um, um, so I haven't even spent any time looking at the videos. I, I should really do that. But, I'm um, you know, I've just been like saying, oh, my God, i got to learn how to play the piano again, you know. <laughs> But um, um, it'll be fine. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Do you sing? Will you be singing? Yeah, I'm gonna be singing. I used to do all the real, the high falsetto parts, 
which I guess I'm expected to do now. Um, I haven't really sung much since then, but uh, I, once I get the keyboard parts down, I'm going to start practicing singing the the ones that I remember or that can pick out from the record. But um, he's wow. going to have to be a, the people are going to have to be a little forgiving for some of those parts. <laughs> you do have your hands full. I know when when you were on uh, on the show what, about a year ago, you were talking about writing music for for television shows, and you said that mm-hmm. you know you're really busy during television season. And I yeah. was wondering when, when is television season? Are, well, that- typically it's um, it starts around August, because most most new shows come out in the fall i guess like september yeah. november for me i mean cause i i do a lot of animation work and so typically we start working on new shows um in august like the beginning of august and then it goes through um what well, could it could go until june um although some of the shows i work on they don't have a budget for that much original music so they just do they might do eight or ten weeks eight or ten episodes worth and then they end up editing that all together for all for the rest of the shows so i guess i'm asking are you currently still in your busy season you know i'm not because um the company that i do most of my work for um they're not doing too well now i think they're going to be sold i think they're for sale anyway so they don't have any new shows coming up, and uh, which in, in this case I'm I'm glad of, so I can do this because I wouldn't be able to I wouldn't be able to play with Todd if I had to do that. I mean I'd have to choose, you know I wouldn't be able to do both. Mm-hmm. And um, so this kind of um, it happened. What do they say? Fortuitously, um, I am doing another project that I have to get somebody to. Actually, I found somebody to split it with me because my wife's directing a, a play, and I was in charge of the music for that, and um, it's quite a bit of music. Um, but I just found somebody who can share the, the job with me, and that doesn't isn't supposed to open till like, the middle of January. So um, that kind of took a load off my mind when I found somebody to help me with it. <laughs> yeah. And... Uh, yeah, but no, if anyone has any TV shows they want me to write for after after this tour, <laughs> I'm 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 available. <laughs> well, do you know are you are you slated to go to the European? Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's going to be wonderful. Oh, you are. Okay. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm uh uh I'm really looking forward to that. I haven't been been over there in a few years, and you know anything in Europe is good. You know, <laughs> you know. I mean, except for the prices. Yeah, but just being with all in all those places where everything's really old is always a real magical experience. Yeah. Hey, uh, we got we got another caller, Chris. You you got anything else? No, except uh, well. Hey, have you got the URL for uh, where Todd put those? Uh, <laughs> wrote down all the, uh, the, all the tracks. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> um, I do. I don't know if I'm a, I'm uh, not supposed to give that to anyone though. Yeah, I don't kidding. think so. There, because <laughs> um, you can't. You can't. I can't. You can't download any of them because uh. I tried that. But um, <laughs> so you I have to try, Chris. You oh well, <laughs> you can't blame me for trying. No, if we get it, we'll pass it on to you. Man. You know, I'd, I'd be happy to give it to you, but I don't know if he would like that. I, I don't know what the policy is. I can find out though. We don't want to get well, too fired. I just, I just think it's wonderful because that's the next step uh, towards having a surround sound mix of a watts. Mm. Uh huh. So if he's he's done that and he's broken it all apart, then he can just go in and. Make a surround sound mix because the surround sound mix he made for Liars was amazing. Um, oh, really? I didn't even hear that. I mean, I have the album, but I didn't hear a surround sound. If if you haven't heard the surround sound mix, you truly have not heard that album. It's, really? It, it's as adventurous as anything he's ever done, um, huh. and it's just wonderful. 
Wow. I love the album. I mean, in fact, uh, the, those, the songs on that album, the lyrics of that album are just so true to life and so um, uh, just spot on, you know. It's like a great novel or something, you know. Some people... You know, sometimes you you'll read a great novel, and at the end of the book, you go, "Wow!" You know, you feel like you really had this amazing experience. And Todd's lyrics are like that too. I mean, they all, especially uh, the, these recent ones. You know, um, I loved uh, uh, Second Wind and Nearly Human, and uh, well, all of them. I mean, you know, Arena's got some great lyrics. Todd and Pete Townsend are pretty much the only rock stars who figured out how to grow old gracefully. Yeah. Well, Todd seems like keeps getting better mm-hmm. to me. Um, you know, he he uh, he's a real um, accomplished, not accomplished, but he, he sings his ass off. You know, he's just really become a real strong singer. And, like, if you listen to his first album, uh Runt. Like the runt, or, or even the second one. Um, I forget. Ballad. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, you know, he sounds kind of tentative on those records, in a lot of places. Um, it's still like it's a charming sound, um, but he sounds like he's just sort of like getting his feet wet, you know. And then um, when I played with him, he started, especially when we toured, he started trying out a lot of different things and. After the first Utopia tour, he was singing really great, you know. And then, but now he's—it's almost like he's—I um, don't know how to describe it, but he's kind of really come into himself, sort of. Coming to his own. Coming to his own, yeah. Yeah, maybe. All right, all right, Chris. Hey, man, appreciate the call. Thanks again. Thank you. All right, buddy. See you, man. Bye-bye. Chris in Kansas City slash Chicago. All right, so we have been rude again. Six one seven, you're with us. Hello, uh, this is Bill Shalom. Hey, Bill. Sorry for the wait, man. Oh, no problem. This is uh, interesting to listen to. Um, when Something Anything came out, my first chance to see Todd after that was at the Spectrum, and he opened up for um, Jeff Beck with the Hello People as his backup band. And then when The Wizard came out, my first chance to see him was at Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, with, uh, I don't it wasn't it wasn't built as Utopia, which was which is built as Todd. And it was actually um Moogie and the Rhythm Kings, I guess. But um and that was with uh Ralph and the band. And uh people the audience hadn't made the transition between the two people, you know, the something anything Todd and the wizard Todd. And people walked out in droves. And uh I, I was wondering if Ralph remembers experiences like that back then. Hello? Hello, Ralph. Hello? Did we lose Ralph? Did we lose Ralph? Uh, Hold on. I think we muted him. Ralph, you there? Yeah. Okay. Somehow you got muted. That's weird. Uh, how dare you mute me? <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't intentional. I mean, hey, I, you're the I, one I who invited me, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> I think it was Melinda. I'm gonna blame her. No. Um, maybe I don't know. Maybe when I was meeting Chris, it just yeah. That's well, yeah. I mean, that's what it was. That, uh, that's a real powerful feeling to be able to mute people, man. <laughs> <laughs> is Chris seven seven three? Is that you, Chris? Yeah. Okay, that's what it was. I'm so, what, so what was the name of the venue that that happened it was, at? It was, in, it was in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. It was a place in the round. Oh yeah, I remember that place. I put, tour, and the the audience hadn't made the transition from something anything Todd to the Wizard Todd, and uh, the audience was there to hear um, you know Hello It's Me and Right Leroy, and they walked out in droves. Really? And it was, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if you remember experiences like that of the audience not, you know, having made that transition. Um, I don't remember that gig. I rem- I, I played. I remember I played there with other people. I, um, I played there with Lou Reed. I know. I, rem- I remember that gig, but we won't get into it. But uh, well, I was just wondering I if it was like, like with Todd. I'm sorry. 
I was wondering, like, when Dylan went electric, the audience booed him. And I know I'm wondering if it was a similar experience with Todd, mm-hmm. like the transition between something anything to Wizard and people not catching up, the audience not catching up at that point in time. You know, I don't remember any specific instances where that happened. I remember audiences being really appreciative, but um, I remember, let's see, when we went on the, was it the Midnight Special, or when we went on a network TV show um, right after Something Anything, um, and we went on with our Utopia costumes, and Todd was... uh, Right, exactly, the makeup and the... Yeah, 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 and so, and I, I don't remember... I just remember some people in the band saying, oh, my God, what the hell is he doing this for? People aren't expecting this. He's going to lose a lot of, you know, a lot of people. And uh, a lot of people tried to talk him out of doing that. And Well, that was the whole Nicky Debacle. Uh, uh, what's his name, the, the guy who did the costumes? Nicky Nichols. Nicky Nichols. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't consider it a debacle, but um, it's actually... I mean, it, it was a kind of a pain to wash that stuff off every night, but um, but Nicky was really great to have around on the road. Let me tell you, because he he's a very uh, smart, supportive person, and he he really helped the band out in so many ways. But um, so for us, it wasn't a debacle, but it was kind of embarrassing when our jazz musician friends would come to the gig, you know. Uh, I remember I had this, I had this, um, I had a friend who was, who's like a really well-known jazz player and he came to, to the gig, I think it was at Carnegie Hall and he came backstage and I was just really embarrassed, you know, and then, um, he played with a Saturday Night Live band and a few weeks later, and he was making fun of me, and then a few weeks later, I saw him playing with the Saturday Night Live band, dressed as a nurse, you know, with a white dress on and a nurse's cap, you know, as part of some skit he was doing. So then I got retribution, he got retribution. Um, But, um, yeah, I'm sure it alienated some people, you know, I mean. Well, it's it's just that the audience had made the transition. Yeah. So, I mean, in my experience in the record business, and I'm talking mainly about major labels, um, and I, I mean, I've worked, you know, I worked for Columbia for four years, um, and their whole philosophy, and I think probably all those labels were like this, all the big, all the major labels, um, their well, philosophy was you start out with something and you don't change it and you build a fan base um, based on whatever style or sound you have. And if you have a hit song, um, or even if you, you start to get some notoriety, you, you, keep whatever your, you keep your scope really narrow and you do your one thing. And then eventually, after five or six albums, then you could branch out um, and and try some new things, and you might bring a lot of people with you, or they might they might be disappointed. Um, but that was what that basically that's what every record company wanted. And so what Todd did was, you know, the opposite of that, and which which I I, I give him a lot of credit for. He he's good at a lot of different things, and he he likes a lot of different kinds of music, and he has a varied influences. So he wasn't afraid to do a song like, like on this record, uh, uh, like a song like "Does Anybody Love You," and then, but then to do a song like "Is It My Name," which is just super, just rocking out, really great. Um, and nowadays, like, I mean, you couldn't, they wouldn't, they wouldn't let you do that. A, a record company wouldn't let you do that. And as a matter of fact, I think. A lot of music fans nowadays, younger ones, um, have been marketed to in such a um, in such a, a limited way that they just kind of judge people based on you know they they judge people based on what the, what their thing is like 
like my son loves speed metal and really super aggressive music. So to him and his friends, like anything else is lame. You know, it could be, you know, it could be something that's just really amazing and they won't even listen to it. They might listen to the intro of one song, but they just, they already know they don't like it because um, it's not their kind of thing. It's not what they, what they feel represents them, you know, that, that, that's true for their lives. And a, a lot of people are like that nowadays, you know, um, and it's really a shame because, uh, and record companies have always discouraged eclecticism from from an artist. They've always discouraged that. And rock critics discourage that, too. Rock Most rock critics really hate that, you know. And so somebody could come out with uh, a new record, um, that's brilliant, but it's a real departure from what their their hit record was or their first record was, and people just rip them apart. You know, who's he trying to be? What is, you know? And it's it's so ridiculous. It's it's. I mean, I guess it's human nature, but it's what happens when people don't get the full picture of something, and they and they have narrow a narrow people are narrow minded and afraid to to try new things, especially kids. You know, like high school kids. I mean, they just want to do what is cool for their, them and their friends. Whatever you know, whatever click they're in. You know, and and they're afraid to try. You know, um, try new stuff. Most of them. It's just it's so it's so sad because that's well. This is my opinion, and I imagine most people listening to this show. Everything that Todd comes out with, it's there's so much variety that you just you just wait for the next thing. What's he going to do the next? Yeah, thing? you never get bored. Yeah, yeah I know. It's never I mean, it's, boring. There's not one song that's boring. It's. I mean, try to listen to more than one Hootie and the Blowfish album. Yeah. When, oh, when I you're know. Out. I'd it's rather awesome. not, if you don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that I that's mean, what one of their songs sounds like the one you just heard, and I I just don't understand how people just don't get it. Yeah. I, you know, when I worked at the record company, I mean, I just saw that so much. And, I mean, it's for every record company, I mean, my wife had several major record deals, and I've been in bands that have been signed and, you know, had fairly popular records. And um, just you're just not allowed to be eclectic. It's a kiss of death. You know, that's what they tell you. And... um because people who like metal music hate wimpy pop music, and pe- people who like relaxing, calming, uh, you know, pretty melodic pop music don't want to hear heavy metal because it doesn't have, you know, it it's, doesn't have the same utility in their life. They they want to put on "Hello, It's Me" when they when they're when they want to relax, you know. They, they'll put on that or James Taylor or Carole King or somebody. And they feel warm and relaxed, and whatever you know troubles they had during the day are being soothed. And the last thing they want is for like a rocking guitar track to come out, come you know, blasting in, you know. And and it's the same with uh, you know um, aggressive rock fans. I I, I was um, reading um, you know like a good example of somebody who. I guess did sort of follow that the the correct record company path, but in a good way is the Chili Peppers, um, because the, their first few albums were all kind of, you know, really raw and aggressive and um, um, you know kind of punky and um, and they sort of gradually started getting into. Um, more creative or or just different more melodic music more yeah. poppy music and as it turns out they kept selling more and more and more records i mean you too did that too you know they were pretty raw in their first two or three albums um but they waited till they were big enough so that people would accept it and i and like i uh i was on i was in uh, the itunes store and i was um, when uh, the Chili Peppers' last record came out, I forget the name of it, but it's, I think it's a double album. It has a lot of really good songs on it, 
And, uh, I mean, these people were, you know, I was reading some of the fans' reviews, and these people were saying, you know, a lot of people loved the, the new stuff, and a lot of people saying, ah, oh, they sold out, they're a bunch of fucking wimps, you know. How could they, you know, how could they disgrace themselves by, you know, and there's a lot of people like that, you know. There's a lot of narrow-minded people in the world, and uh, it's too complicated for them to appreciate uh, different kinds of things, you know. But I would be, I would bet that most of Todd's fans like lots of different kinds of music. Um, oh, I think most, I think they do. I think we do. <laughs> and most, and most, most kind of intelligent people, I guess, that I know, you know, like a lot of different kinds of things, and they they sort of research stuff, like. And I know a lot of young musicians who are like this too. You know, I, I work with a lot of young players and singers and stuff. And I mean, some of them don't know anything about anything. But you know, like this one guy I'm working with now, and he, I think he's 24, and he would, uh, you know, hear a record, I don't remember what, and then he'd read an in, somebody's interview who did the record, and then. He, that person might mention, oh, well, I was really influenced by so-and-so, you know, David Bowie or whatever. And so then he'd go and he'd buy some David Bowie records or buy some David Bowie songs, and he'd get really interested in that, you know, and then he'd read that David Bowie was interested in somebody, was influenced by somebody else. And so then he'd, like, listen to that stuff, and he'd just, and that's what my friends and I all did. I mean, every guy in in the Utopia band, I mean, they're, they were like a musically hip bunch, you know. I mean, we, we were into every good kind of music, you know. And um, it's just sad that nobody, that people can't appreciate some really good stuff. But um, yeah. I actually had, it's a, there's a funny story, but maybe it'll be, I think it's too long. To say on to say on the show, I'll tell you when I meet you. Sounds good. We'll have plenty of time. Hope. <laughs> Very nice. All right. Hey, um, let's see, Bill. I think Bill disappeared on us. We got another call from area code nine one two. You're with us. Hi, it's Cindy K Mills. Hey, Cindy K Mills. I know you. <laughs> yes, you do. How are you, Ralph? I'm good. Thank you for all those. Uh, warm and welcoming uh, messages. Well, I, I felt like you needed to uh, form a welcome from the... I was speaking for everybody, welcoming you to the adventure of a what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's an adventure. <laughs> All right. <laughs> it's kind of a hair-raising adventure at the moment, but it'll get better. <laughs> well, we're all looking forward to seeing um, seeing it happen again. Oh, me so, too. I'm so just, I'm so psyched. I just wanted to say hi. I didn't know if you could um, understand the southern, um, this Georgia peach girl from <laughs> from way down south. But um, I've been down well, south many times. You know, good. Well, you know, talking about narrow-minded people and their music, and I hate yeah. to say it because I'm a, some of my friends I, my might might make mad right now, but. I talked a lot to people about the order of the AWAT songs, um, and when I had heard Todd on Roman Radio say that had he been able to produce it, you know, on um, you know CD as you can now, not the LP where you have to you know flip it over, uh-huh. that there he may have done it totally differently. Yeah. And to a lot of people, that just really freaked them out. Because I, I said one time, I said, I hope he does it in the order he thinks it should be done in, which, yeah, a lot of people didn't like that though. <laughs> but guess yeah. what? He did it in the order he thought it should be done in, and I was very, very, br- I was happy. <laughs> I was, yeah, you know what I'm saying? Oh, oh you mean you thought the, he was going to do the? He was going to do the concert in a different order. The songs in a different order, of course. Yeah, I see what nine, you mean. First, first nine songs were the same, okay, but then then he started flipping it up, and it made it it made it very interesting. So I, I'm sure you already know that, though. <laughs> no, you know I don't know that, and actually I I've got to talk to him because if he's planning on doing that, I'd like to know because I'm kind of. I mean, I'm sure it's going to be a surprise no matter what. Well, when, I'm when trying to hear- sort of learn them in in the order of the record. 
Oh, yeah, you may want to watch what I don't know how he's done all the others. He may not have even done them all in the same order. But I thought it was very interesting because you know everybody has their own um, expectations of musicians, and if they ever fall short or vary from that, you know, it, it, it's a it's pretty hard, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I've been looking yeah. at some stuff, and just one quick question, if you can answer it quickly. What is peanut butter conspiracy? Oh, that was a a band that was one of the first um, West Coast psychedelic bands to get signed to a major label. And who was in that? You were in that band. I was in that band for a short time. I wasn't in the original band. Um, I was in a different band, a couple of different bands. But um, when my other band broke up... um, they asked me to join them, and they they were we all hung out together, and they were friends of mine. Um, and I guess they they were I think the first like kind of super long haired freak hippie <laughs> band um, to sign with Columbia Records, and they got a a really big push, and it was right around the time the whole San Francisco sound was was just breaking right out. with the airplane and yeah and there and, and all these bands had names like that like you know Jefferson right. Airplane Quicksilver Messenger Service uh Steve Miller Band you know. <laughs> and so i guess that that's that's what they you know like recently i guess when was it i don't know like around the time U2 started really hitting big for a while you know, every band had a a one word name you know right and, <laughs> And that was Easier popular. To say it that way. That was popular for you know maybe it still is I don't know, but um, um, so they they and I have no idea of the origin of the name, but I, I still talk to those guys. It's funny, um, 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 mostly online, but um, there's a resurgence in interest in those kind of bands. And, Definitely, uh, because they, new music is not like old music, and that's why when they make new music like old music, I like it. But, yeah. You know. Well, that was a time when, like, when people, when bands weren't, they didn't copy each other, you know. They didn't copy what was a big hit. Right. Um, and it was, a, and, you know, it was a time, I guess, economically it was feasible for that to happen, and um so like you have all these bands from different different towns and basically they would have uh you know there was no guitar player magazines or electronic keyboard magazines there and there were no interviews with so and so and what kind of pickup hey, most, most of our small towns didn't even have newspapers but once a week <laughs> yeah okay well there you go yeah, so most most bands you know they get together in somebody's parents garage They'd buy whatever equipment um, their local music store had, you know, and they'd just be creative, you know. And, and uh, I mean, and some of it, I mean, if you listen to some of it now, I mean, some of it's pretty horrible. But because there's, you know, there's all these, I don't know how many, maybe just one or two streaming stations, uh, Internet streaming stations that, that specialize in like uh, psychedelic rock or underground rock from the late 60s early 70s and um i don't know if you guys ever listen to that stuff but there's a a whole lot of fan it has a whole lot of fans Hmm. and um and the peter butter conspiracy has a lot of fans and they have their own website and um have fans all over the world and the band i was in which is called clear light somebody built a website devoted to us and we never even met the guy and he's got like uh i mean i've spoken to him now a few times he's a really great guy but he knows more about the guys in this band than we know about each other (laughs) you know i mean he's got everyone's bios and you know we never even you know and uh and he sent me it's really been cool because i've reconnected with some of those guys and and uh but he sent me uh covers of songs we did from Spain and South America and, and Asia and like a band in, you know, I don't remember where it was, Thailand or something, covered one of our obscure songs, you know. Mm. And 
you know, it's, it's a trip, and they, and they all talk to each other. All these people, probably like you guys, yeah, you know, and and they just mine the, the they they just dig and dig and dig for whatever local psychedelic bands you know they can find that might have recorded something you know, and and there's a lot of those bands out there, and uh, it's interesting. And you listen to them, I and mean, some of them are just horrendous, you know, but. They're all. Some of them are are great, and what they all have in common is none of them sound alike. Nobody's copying anybody, um, and they're they're not following any kind of formula whatsoever. They're they're not caring about whether it's a hit. They're just being what they think is artistic, you know. And and so it's interesting, you know. It's interesting to hear all these different different styles. Um, but that's a, yeah, that's a whole world um, that um, th- that's a whole other group of fans. So that's so the sp- uh, consp- peanut butter conspiracy. Um, they have a lot of fans in that world. In fact, they did their first gig in um, you know probably since the late '60s. They they got together and did a gig a, a few weeks ago at Amoeba Records here in L.A., which is really. Do you know what that is? Yeah, I sent them a yeah. uh, letter today. It's not a yeah. flyer to put up for the show. <laughs> yeah, they have yeah. live shows there. A lot of famous people at that point. Yeah, they, they had, had a and, record and store. Somebody just put out uh, an anthology of L.A. psychedelic bands and hmm. um, from the '60s, and Peanut Butter Conspiracy was one of them. And they had and they performed there. I think I couldn't go because I I can't remember, but um, they sent me a video of it and. Uh, uh, you know, and there's a lot of people there who were into them, you know, young and old. <laughs> wow, old school. You were there from 68 to 70, so. The yeah, yeah. Very nice. Well, right, Cindy. Okay. I had a lot of fun in that band. I, we really, it was a real, <laughs> we were real friends, and we, we just had a lot of fun. We did, cool. we did, uh, we, um, we did. We toured a lot in different areas around the country, and it was real low budget touring. You know, we didn't have roadies, or because by that time, you know, they weren't. They hadn't fulfilled the commercial promise that the record company thought they would. You know, um, mm-hmm. and so, but they still were a band. So we played in you know roadhouses and clubs and theaters, like in a lot of different places. And we just drove around from town to town, and it was real. Um, it was a real like band, you know. It was like a young band situation, you know. It was really yeah. Fun. <laughs> the young days. Yeah. All right, Cindy, I appreciate the call. Thanks for calling in from okay. Joe. Yeah, Cindy, I'll cool. see hey. you uh, when I'll I see, see you. I'll see you in L.A. Cool. Ventura, L.A. gigs. Yeah. Uh, Coming in from Georgia. Wow. I love well, it. Yeah. All right, so we got a call from area code seven zero eight. You're with us, I think. Let's see. What hey, time. Doug. There you go. Hey, man. Well, it's Rich. Uh, I talked to you last week about Park West, but uh, oh, cool. about sitting yeah. down at Park West. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, a uh, really interesting show tonight. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm finally being able to listen to it live instead of on the treadmill on the podcast. But um, I'm just sitting here making some signs up for a pharmacy for the H1N1 flu shots. Mm. But uh, uh, Ralph, interesting stuff, really. Um, oh, I, was just, I always uh, think I'm putting people to sleep. No, man. It, I mean, <laughs> you know, uh, people who are interested in music are interested in the behind the scenes stuff, you know. Yeah. I mean all we get is the finished product, you know. Yeah. And um I uh you know that red hot chili peppers at uh, Rick Rubin, man, he he has molded those guys into a into a killer band. I saw Yeah, that, that, they're one of my favorite stadium, bands. stadium Arcadium uh album. I saw that tour, I saw them twice on that tour and mm-hmm. you know, they're just and you know, I mean people are saying that well they're not you know they're growing as a band. You know exactly. I mean, you have I mean, to grow. I mean, uh, and, and plus, if they kept on doing what they were doing back when they started out, they'd all be dead. You know. So, <laughs> I mean, this is um, true. And you know, I mean, 
fun. And also, they'd be bored, you know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, so, if they weren't dead, they'd be bored. <laughs> but that Rick Rubin, man, that guy has done so much with so many bands. It's yeah, awesome. he's a great producer. I mean, uh, unbelievable. But, um, um, you know, you were talking about Todd and all the different things he's done. And I remember when he came to town for uh, the No World Order CD that he did. And, uh, uh, I don't think I have that one. Well, it's, it's all compute. It's all like synthesizer and keyboards, and uh-huh. it's, kind of, it, it, it's Todd's attempt, I think, at rapping also. Uh-huh. And uh-huh. when he came to town, WXRT is the big station here in Chicago, uh-huh. and um, he came in to do a live thing with them. Mm-hmm. And uh, the whole idea behind this album was uh, it was interactive, where the fan could actually change the song, and they're coming out. Oh, I heard now, about that. To uh, to do this right, well, he he walked in there and I heard a, I heard the interview and they're like, what the hell is this stuff? What the hell is he putting out? You know, uh-huh. they you know because they're used to the regular old Todd stuff that he's done. You know, and yeah, they, yeah. But this was really he he just swerved off the road on this one. You know, and yeah, and um, you know I don't know if the uh, you know it. it messed up their relationship or not but I, I you know uh from then on i've never heard xrt sponsoring the shows and stuff so, uh-huh. you know yeah i know i know that you know might have ruffled some feathers or something that I, I i don't understand yeah that. But, could be i mean i would you know they didn't understand what he was trying to do either you yeah know? you I know mean, it's it's funny because um well t- one thing about him is he's really fearless and um, that's why uh, I have a lot of respect for him, um, because he's a real, he's a, a, a consummate artist, and he he does he, his stuff is he does his his stuff for he doesn't do it only for himself. I mean he he knows there's an audience out there, and his music it's not like it's so strange it's not accessible. I mean it's all pretty you know easy to understand music but um but he's fearless about it you know and uh and he he's one of the few that tries like new things some of them work and some of them don't you know but um I'm probably every great artist uh you know does that they like to stretch you know and they like to they like to get out of their comfort zone and I think that's that's what he does a lot um I know he did that with the band when I was in the band because, um, you know, before that he was, he had been in bands and stuff, but um, he was kind of a shy person and he he had done most of, or maybe not most, but a lot of his recording by himself. I don't think when Utopia toured, I think there, he had only, he had one, done one tour before that which only lasted a few days and they had a lot of technical problems and so he hadn't really toured and with a bunch of guys you know and um and he hadn't had to sing every night for 6 8 weeks you know uh in the winter time when everyone had the flu you know and you were always getting sore throats and stuff like that so i mean it was a, it was a deliberate i think a deliberate attempt on his part to get out of his comfort zone and to do something that was not natural for him, you know. Um, and uh, and he's always doing stuff like that. I mean, I, I, I assume he still is. Um, and you have to do, an artist has to do that, you know. You, if you get too comfortable, if there's no risk involved, then you're going to get stale, you know. You have to like, and a lot of people put themselves in situations like, that are uncomfortable like that because they know it'll bring out some new, you know, new, new stuff in their work. Um, so that's that. That's that about him. But you know, on the other hand, um, I can really understand how if somebody spends a certain amount of money on a record or a song for a specific purpose and a specific feeling they want to get at a particular time, 
you know, they, I guess, you know, you, you could say they have a right to demand whatever, you know, whatever they want. You know, I shouldn't really, you know what I mean? I, it, I don't want to, like, govern what people can and can't listen to, but I just wish people had a little more of an open mind. But, but I mean, you know, if you like folk music and that makes you feel good, you shouldn't have to be, you know, subjected to heavy metal music just because <laughs> trying to open your mind, you know. Um I just wish more people, I guess, would would give things that are different a chance, at least. You know, like give the stuff a chance. And Todd's the perfect example of somebody who, if he was, if people would give him more of a chance, you know, they'd be con, they'd become converts. You know, um, but that's just my own kind of spouting opinion. Um, yeah. <laughs> there you go. All right. I guess uh, I can hear. I can hear Doug is back there going. Oh, uh, this guy just oh, disappeared. I, heard, I thought I he was going to say sick. something. <laughs> My caller disappeared. Yeah, uh, he got. He disappeared. He. I mean, he got cut off somehow. Yeah. Well, he hung up. I heard think. Him. All right. Anyway. Um. How much more go time back do we have? Forget. You. you huh? Um. Well, we have uh, 19 minutes. Oh. Okay. Are you good? Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. Well, I uh, I definitely got to get you that that uh, audio video stuff because he does change the order, and uh, I'm sure it's going to stay that way. So I, that that can seriously throw you off if you're learning it from the album. Uh, I'll email you. As a matter of fact, I'll email you the order. And oh, terrific! That That's great. Uh, but that I'll would be great because I'm going to program my you know my keyboard to to be in a certain order. Mm-hmm. And if he changes it, I'll have to mess around and yeah. more time <laughs> so, yeah, it. They got off one time. It was uh, in Minnesota. Uh, I don't know if it's Roger or Greg, but uh, I don't want to tie you down. Started after Cool Jerk, and it wasn't supposed to work that way. So uh, they caught it pretty quick, but it was kind of funny. Oh, I see. Yeah. yeah oh, actually, the, the the best part was at the first show, Doug, mm-hmm. when the band had it correct. And started playing. Uh, what was it? They started playing. So, uh, help me here. What are you talking about? An archer. Mm-hmm. Oh, I love and, that song. Uh, oh, Todd yeah. thought he was supposed to be wearing a different yeah, outfit. outfit. <laughs> and, yeah, so they put him in the wrong outfit. And, and <laughs> who who was supposed to be wearing a different outfit? Todd. Oh, Todd. Todd. Oh, oh, oh. But, yeah, you'll see on the video. He's oh, like, he does costume changes. You kidding me? Yeah. Ah, cool. They're, they're wild. You won't believe it. See, they, you know, he anything lets you be surprised too. <laughs> he gives his fans their money's worth. He Let definitely. Me tell you, he did, no doubt. He on does, that. you know, and and uh, you know, like, um, you know, he cares about his fans definitely. He respects them, and and uh, you know, he's he's uh, he doesn't he's never, you know, he could when I play with him, you know, sometimes he could be kind of a snotty guy, but he he would never be that way to a fan, to somebody who liked his music, you know, I've never, I never saw that happen, and um, I've seen it happen with plenty of other people, you know, but um, I just thought of another story, talk about um, uh, people's tastes and narrow-mindedness and all that stuff like that, um, do you know who Jimmy Iovine is? No. Uh, oh, well, he he's one of the owners of Interscope Records, and he produced uh, uh, a couple of Bruce Springsteen albums and um, um, U2 albums and Tom Petty and Patti Smith. Um, he's produced a lot of big records, and, and he's, a, he's a very successful uh, record company guy, owner, and has been for like 20 years. Um, and he was telling me um, this story um, when he was younger and no, and he still hadn't made it as a producer yet. Um, uh, he was he was an engineer first, and um, so there was this band Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers who he really liked, and um, they uh, they had made two records. For us, um, I forget the name of the record company, but it, they went out of business, and uh, they were both really good records, I think. But 
Um, and he was a fan of the band, so he was thinking, well, what what I need to do to get my career further is to find you know find a band like any producer, find a band that I really love, and work with them, you know, and and make you know try and get successful with them. And so he contacted Tom Petty, and they were uh, these guys were like starving. They were living in like funky motels in L.A. and you know, nobody had any money, and they made these two albums, which are great. I think are really good albums. Um, and nobody, you know, they both bombed basically. The, the none of them sold. Um, you know, so as far as most record companies, they were over. You know, and but Jimmy was like a fan of theirs, so he got in touch with them, and they said, "We'll come out to L.A. You know, and let's let's hear what, and we'll play some of our new songs and." So he went out there. Anyway, long story short, he loved their new material, and he was really into the band. And so, for no money, you know, he got he got a, a good recording studio to give him some time on spec. And um, you know, the band went in and started recording the album that ended up being "Damn the Torpedoes," which was a huge success. Yeah. And and um, and has like some really good songs on it. And uh, um. And so these, they were all, you know, he was really young and they were really young and everyone was scuffling and, you know, nobody had any money and everyone was just kind of doing this labor of love. And Jimmy kind of put himself on the line with the record, uh, with the recording studio and with the engineer, you know, who he, he owed a ton of money to this guy who was a great engineer and uh, who, when he first started working on the project, he thought that the band had been signed, you know, and so everyone was really out on a limb for this record. And when it was finished, and they worked really hard on it, when it was finished, um, um, he went. At, there's a record. There used to be a, a recording studio called Record Plant in New York, where a lot of big records were recorded. And Jimmy Jimmy started out there as an assistant engineer, and um, so he went. He there. There's a couple, there's a woman who works there, who used to work there, who had a teenage ch- a kid, and who went to high school in Staten Island, and um, so he had the idea that he would get this kid's class to come in, or maybe it's junior high school, get this kid's class to come in, and he would play him the new stuff that he'd been working on, and see what they thought. So the class comes in, it's like a field trip for the class, you know. So the class comes in. And he starts playing them. He had two records that he completed. One was Tom Petty, and the other one was another guy. I can't remember who he is, but nothing ever happened with his career. And his his music sounded very much like Journey, who was really huge at the time. So are you with me here? We're with you. (laughs) Okay. So anyway, um, so he played the four best songs of each album. And there's 32 kids in the class. And every single one of them hated Tom Petty and loved the other guy, and <laughs> and he had just—I mean, he he had maxed out several credit cards doing this record. You know, he he was this was like it was like an all or nothing situation, and he was sure that this band was going to be popular, Tom Petty, and all of a sudden, and he wasn't that into the other guy, I guess, and. All of a sudden, he started, you know, he he had a panic attack, you know, because he said, oh, my God, what if I put the last year and a half of work and put myself in debt and everything for this band and kids aren't going to like it, (laughs) you know? And he was just flipping out, you know. I mean, and I know how he feels because I've been in that situation. So anyway, turns out, as we all know, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers became a huge band with just hit after hit after hit after hit, and um, the other guy no one ever heard of. <laughs> and um, so he told he told me this story, and he said, "Why do you think you know that happened?" You know, and I said, well, "I don't know." You know, he said, "Well, the reason is because he talked to the he, he talked to the kid, you know, the the." kids afterwards you know i guess he he kept up with a couple of them and the reason is is because 
when kids are in junior high school, they're afraid of new things, and they're afraid to like anything that the cool people in school don't like. And so a buzz gets going about a certain artist or a certain name or a certain kind of clothing or something, and everybody jumps on the bandwagon and is into that because that's yeah. what everyone's into. And you know what I mean? And and nobody there was nobody in the rock pop world at the time who sounded remotely like Tom Petty who has kind of a a weird sort of nasal voice, you know, and some of his music is not you know, it's not particularly aggressive and I don't know, you know. Um uh and so kids didn't like it cuz they never heard anything like that before. And there's always, but there's always like a group of kids who are like the arty kids, you know, or who are like the, you know, sort of the intellectuals or the the kids that are determined not to be into whatever's popular. <laughs> I was always one of those kids. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and uh, and so if so, like for for the first like until maybe 1987, I never heard any Elton John songs or Led Zeppelin or David Bowie or anybody that was really big like that. I just, for some reason, a lot of my friends were like this. It's like, well, if they're really big, they must not be very good, you know, because everybody likes them and they probably sold out or whatever, you know. And um, and so that's, so. The, but th those are the kids that discover new stuff and then somehow somebody hears it, you know, somebody, somebody, you know, maybe a kid who's like a popular kid and is sort of borderline friends with this kid, you know, maybe their parents are friends or something. So he'll say, okay, well, what do you, you know, play, go ahead and play it for me. And the kid in the arty kid will say, wow, isn't this great? These guys are really great. And the other guy go, yeah, I do like that, you know. <laughs> or you know, like beer. When you yeah, beer. you know, or like you know, you loan me that album, and the first couple of times I listened to it, I just couldn't couldn't get into it. I mean, so many people have said that to me about so many big records. You know, when I first got it, I just I don't know, I just didn't get it. You know, I couldn't understand it. But the more I listened to it, I started to realize that it's really good. Hmm. You know, and um, I think that's just what happens. You know. Um, with a lot of popular music, you know, um, as with kids particularly. I don't know if grown-ups are like that, but yeah, you can tell who the kids like pretty quick. They they do great marketing for them too. Once they get once they catch yeah, them. well that now it's it. now it's such a science. It's just disgusting. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, and and a lot of kids resent it too. I mean, a lot of kids don't want to be manipulated. I mean, that was the whole grunge thing. Was like. Nobody wanted to be sold something, you know. Nobody wanted to have to wear certain kinds of clothing because, I mean, not nobody, but a certain group of people said, man, this is all bullshit. These commercials are bullshit. MTV is bullshit. <laughs> you know, the radio, you know, the pop radio is bullshit. All that stuff is bought, you know. You know, it's all payola and it's all, you know, we need, we want something that's like, the real thing that's for us that's like real kids stuff you know right. music for and by kids like us you know maybe a couple mm -hmm. years older but kids who are going through the same shit we're going through you know and so that's how movements like grunge or like the san francisco scene or you know like any kind of or rock and roll itself let's talk about a perfect example you know like i work with um Levon Helm once, and he was telling me, you know, he grew up in Arkansas across the river from Memphis, and he's the same age as Elvis. And he knew Elvis, and he knew, this, you know, he played with some of the same people who played with Elvis, and they were all kind of like in the same musician scene, and they would play frat parties mainly, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and in those days, musicians were not cool. You know, football players were cool. Musicians were not cool. So nobody respected him, and, uh, you know, people made fun of him. People treated him like shit, you know, and um, that's just the way it was. They did it for the love of it. They were musicians because that's what they did. 
And he was telling me that's what happened with Elvis, you know, the whole thing with Elvis was like Elvis was the real thing, you know, when he first started out. He was a real kid, you know, doing an original kind of thing. I mean, he, you know, he copied a lot of stuff from black performers, but, you know, he was one of the first white people to really rock and to sing sexual music and then move to it and stuff. And, um, you know, and so all the underground kids from where they all grew up, you know, all the their friends were listening to Elvis and people like him, you know. And everybody else was into Pat Boone and, you know, all these, like, super clean, you know, uh, manufactured, you know, pop artists, you know. Um, and... Um, and that's what that's how rock and roll was born you know it was it wasn't popular it was too weird for people you know mm -hmm. and um and especially down south people were scared of it you know they people said oh this is nigger music you know we can i mean the first time elvis re appeared on uh on the ed sullivan show his first national tv appearance they would not photograph him from the waist down they just showed him from the chest up. They wouldn't show his lower body because they thought it was lewd and it would turn off a lot of the sponsors and a lot of the fans, you know, the people out there in America. So they couldn't show his body moving, you know. Um, right. And that's what the mentality was like that. I mean, can you imagine if those people ever saw Prince or, you know, uh, I don't know, you know <laughs> Never would have the Sex Pistols yeah. or something, uh -huh. you know, I mean... <laughs> They'd have a heart attack, you know, but so and then then he said that when Elvis got, you know, when he, he got with Colonel Parker and he got a big record deal with RCA and he started doing more polite, um, pleasant music that wasn't as raw. And obviously he sold a lot more records and, you know, um, and he was in and he started doing all these cheesy movies and like um all his friends who just who were really into rock and roll, they were just disappointed, you know, because what had made him great initially he was starting to lose, you know. And he was becoming a puppet for, you know, music business executives and stuff. And uh and a lot of rock critics really think that was the real tragedy be tragedy of Elvis was when he first started he invented a whole new thing. And he wasn't afraid to just get right out there with it, you know. And then he started, you know, he started making money, and then he got, you know, a big-time manager. And then they said, well, you know, we sold a million records, but we can sell eight million if you clean it up a little bit, you know. Um, if you do a few of these movies and, you know, some of these cheesy movie soundtracks and stuff, you'll they make were cheesy. Yeah, and you'll make, but he made a whole lot more money. He did, except, you know, maybe he wouldn't have. I don't know. A lot of people think that if he would have stuck to his guns, and and taken himself seriously as an artist, rather than like an entertainer or a show business person, that maybe all that stuff wouldn't have happened to him. You know, who knows? I mean, hindsight know. twenty twenty, but. Yeah, yeah, definitely a major influence, obviously. Um, all right, so we only got a couple minutes, and i got to call. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm off. rambling. I like okay. to talk. Good stuff. love talking about Elvis. 305, you're with us. Hey. Hey, is this Ralph? Yeah. Hey, this is uh, Eddie Zine. I knew you, I think. In hey, New Eddie. Week. Yeah, I know you. Uh, yeah. How are I'm, you, man? Uh, good. I, I, you know, I missed most of the show because I've been packing at night because I'm going to New York uh, in the morning. But uh, I remembered you were on, so I'm going to download the, uh, if Doug and Mel put up the uh, uh, broadcast, I'm going to take it with me and listen to it on my way up. But oh, I'm looking, cool, man. Forward, looking forward to seeing you playing uh, yeah. I'm, I'm are, in L.A. Are, oh, you, are, in LA. you live in L.A.? No, I'm in Miami. Oh, are you but still playing I'm, drums? Yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm, I'm playing with the bass player from Foghat in a band called Tony Stevens Slow Ride. I play cool. with Fernando Perdomo with Dreaming in Stereo, and and uh, as I know, Mel and Doug know, I, uh, the Hall and Oates released a, a four CD set a week ago, I think, and and a tra tracks from uh, 1975 are on there with me uh, on the first disc. But I'm yeah, that, you playing 
say? Go ahead. No, I, 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 that's when I met you. You were Hall & Oates drummer. And uh, I remember going to Central Park and seeing the, you playing with Todd. Uh, and that, that was one of my favorite lineups, and I can't wait to see you doing it again, man. Was that the, the one that, with the live recording? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was great. That was my first gig with him, and it was really... Well, well, there's a lot of the stuff you did with him that's on record that just amazing stuff. So I'm, yeah. and I remember you were hanging in an apartment, I think, with Stephen Deese's or, or a friend of Stephen Deese, uh, and you were, uh, I forget who you, you were playing behind a, a singer. I can't remember her name right now. Hmm. Uh, but I uh, played, well, I played on Stephen Deese's record. Okay, uh, there you go. That Daryl produced. Right. Maybe it was oh, there. Yeah, it. that's probably it. Well, I'm really happy to see that uh, you'll be doing this. Oh, me I'll, too, I'll, man. Thank you. I, I, I'm I'm so looking forward to it. All right. Well, I'm going to get off, Doug and Mel. I know you're up against uh, the the edge here. Yep. Of your, Ten seconds. Your, All right. Hey, appreciate you calling me, man. Good seeing you in uh, Philly. Uh, I, yeah, it was great. Meeting Are you, you from Philly? No, I went there to, when Doug and went and Mel went there to see oh. the uh, all the notes played and Todd played the last show at the uh, Spectrum. Oh, oh. Yeah, they, they, uh, they're demolishing the Wachovia Spectrum, and Todd and, uh, and the Hooters had a show over there. Oh, uh, yeah. I love yeah. the Hooters. They're, they're friends of mine, too. I, I oh, worked, is that right? Yeah, that's right. You told I work with um, Rob and Eric a lot. Yeah. Oh, I'll tell you what, they, they, still, they can still play. Man, it yeah. was good. It was yeah, Rob's night. the guy I was telling you about who has all the organs. I don't know if he still <laughs> does, but he used to have, like... <laughs> A big warehouse full of antique instruments. Oh, that's the guy. Okay, okay. Yeah, they put on a show, man. It was a great show over there. And, yeah, and they're uh, they're they're really good musicians and writers, and you know they had. I mean, time after time, it's one of the best pop songs ever written. And what if God was one of us? You know, Eric wrote that in one night. You know. Um, he wrote that. Yeah, he wrote oh, it all by that. himself. That's a good song, yeah. Yeah, he's no a question. talent. They're, they're, those guys are really talented guys. Yeah, so Eddie's flying in from Miami, and then we have uh, another EJ's flying in Fort Lauderdale. We have some Florida contingent coming in for these gigs. And wow. he, Eddie, I think, has got a gig with uh, this guy he plays with, Fernando. They're going to do a couple while they're around there in California. Or maybe it's Fernando has a place there or something. But he'll be uh -huh. at the L.A. gig and maybe Ventura, which is – L.A. is going to be the biggest one. That's going to be at the um, Orpheum Theater. And Kaz has been like, I mean, he he does a lot of stuff on his own too. I mean, has he been active as a solo artist all these years? Uh, off and on, he, he, off and he on. has been. Yeah, it's you know because he's mo mainly toured with Meatloaf, so yeah, but he's 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 still been pretty active solo, and he's he's got a band now. But he's I know he's got a gig too. coming up next week, I think, right? Yeah, yeah, uh, he's yeah. got a couple over in the Philly area, and then. Um, I think he's I think he's through with Meatloaf, so he's probably going to be doing more solo stuff and band stuff on his own. Last time I saw him, I think he was playing with Joan Jett. Yeah, that was a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, and I've only I only played with Kaz once, which was a one-off thing that when Todd played in Saturday Saturday Night Live. Oh yeah. And that's the only time I ever hung out with Kaz, but I love him. He's he's another great musician and really nice guy. Yep. Well, you'll be working with him real soon. Yeah, yeah as a matter of fact, I've, I've been me I, I've been meaning to call him. I, I've been wanting to call him. I spoke to Willie Wilcox. I talked to him from time to time. I spoke to him a couple of days ago, and um, he gave me ta um, Kaz's phone number. Um, yeah, Willie and Kaz stay in touch a lot. Of, uh, yeah, him. Willie's yeah. great. I love him. He's he's such a cool guy. Yeah. Um, Kaz, what song was that y'all did on Saturday Night Live? Oh, I don't remember yeah. what song. It was a weird, it was, I think, I guess we did two songs. It was a weird, um, it was a band, it was like everybody in the band except me never played with Todd again or before that. Hmm. It was, I think Michael Shreve from Santana was on drums and um, what's the name of that really great uh, keyboard player? Um, David Sanchez. Hmm. You know who he is? Mm -mm. Oh God, he's a killer, amazing keyboard player. He was in Sting's band, and he wow. was in 
Bruce Springsteen's original E Street Band. He was the first piano player he had, and um, he's played with a lot of big, famous jazz people. He's one of those, like, just technical whiz guys, you know. He can just play anything. <laughs> so he was... I can find that on YouTube. Yeah. Oh, you can find a lot of his stuff on... And he writes beautiful music, too. Now, I want to find the one you and Kazan together. I'll have to look that yeah, up. Yeah, you know, um, yeah, I, there. that might be on YouTube. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember it because, well, <laughs> another funny story, but I don't know if we have time for it. <laughs> I, 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 it's a short story. I was, I was, um, Prince was on that show too, and oh, that show. Was yeah, it Tom Hills and Healer. Somebody said it might have been Tom Hills and Healer. Yeah, that sounds right. Okay. So, um, <laughs> uh, so anyway, um. I met uh, one of uh, you know Doctor Funk, the one of one of Prince's keyboard players, and um, so they told me, well, you got to go get your makeup, get, go get you go into makeup because you guys are going to be on soon. And so I went to this. I said, where's makeup? And somebody told me go to this room. So I went to this makeup room, and you know, there's all these makeup, these like barber chairs, and. Um, Dr. Funk is in there. I was a fan of his, and so we started talking. And you know, we were talking for like, and I'm thinking, and I keep looking around. Where's the makeup person? And anyway, it turns out there's two makeup rooms, <laughs> and um, somebody comes running in and goes, "Ralph, you guys are on in 30 seconds. Where have you been?" I said, "I'm, <coughs> I'm in makeup." And and then they, so I come running out. You know, Todd's counting off the song, and Chasm. Uh, leans over to me and says, um, Todd, "The song Todd can't sing it in the in the original key, so he's doing it a half step higher." And um, this is like as he's counting off the song, <laughs> and um, you know, transposing a song into a, a new key a half step higher. I mean, it's 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 not easy. Let's put it that way. But the keyboard that he had me playing had a little transpose knob. <laughs> so I, luckily, I just, uh, I just, you know, turned the knob to the next key and played it the way I knew it. But it was funny. <laughs> That's uh, funny because as of uh, last time he was on the show, he spoke about that same episode. Oh, did he? Yeah. Yeah. Well, basically, uh, actually, I had, I think, I had asked him if he had ever met Prince, and he he was talking about playing on that show. Yeah. That uh, he ran into him later on at some Seven Eleven, and Prince was buying a bunch of junk food, and <laughs> apparently was not very friendly. Yeah, Prince is. Uh, you know, I mean, it, it, whenever I've been in the same room with him, um, he's got a shield around him. You know, I mean, he definitely doesn't want anyone to bother him. And, and I think it's. Uh, I mean, from what I people say, he's just really shy. But, but. Um, you know, because I've been on Saturday Night Live actually twice when he was on, and they have a casting cast party afterwards at a restaurant. And both times, like when Prince walked in, you know, it was like you just could tell he didn't want anybody to approach him. You know. Yeah. Yeah. But I've seen him inter- interviewed um, on TV, and he's a really a quite personable guy with a great sense of humor and you know he doesn't you know he's he's a very interesting person well it's probably i'm sure it's hard to to be in his shoes and everybody wants to say something to you and you know all that kind yeah of, it's got to be difficult yeah everyone is you know everyone is a potential energy drain mm-hmm. <laughs> you know and and if you if you want to do high quality you know if you're a visionary like that you know you need all the energy you can get you know yeah, definitely. All right, good deal. Well, hey, Ralph, it's been great again as usual. And, For me uh, too, man. I'm glad. I, I hope I didn't talk too much. No, well, it's I, great. I just hope that we didn't drain too much of your energy. <laughs> no, no. I, I'm well. I'm not a visionary. Okay, I'm just a keyboard player. But uh, no, you know, truthfully, some people, on the other hand, give you a lot of energy. Which, you know, when when you meet a new person. 
unless you're going to be totally sheltered, you have to open yourself up and take the risk because if you don't let anybody talk to you, you never know what you're missing. You might be missing the most incredible conversation you ever had in your life, you know. But definitely, Todd, you guys and Todd's, all of these fans have definitely given me energy, I'll tell you. I mean, I had no idea. <laughs> well, great. 